Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you for joining us today. I have the honor of being here with someone who is a U.S. investing championship competitor and in the lead, Andrew O'Connell. He is also the founder of Pristine Capital, Invest Intelligently. So Andrew, so happy to have you here today. How you doing? Thank you so much for having me, Rosanna. I'm doing awesome. How are you? Great. So excited to just dive right in and know your secret sauce. So, mm -hmm. okay. U.S. Investing Championship. You're in the enhanced, enhanced division with futures and options trading. So how are you doing it? You're almost at about 50% in returns in quarter one. This is a tough year. How's it? What are you doing? What's what's the secret? Yeah, there's there's a lot of different components. I'm sure we can dive into a lot of them during this chat, which is great. But really what it comes down to is having a very detailed process, very detailed risk parameters. And then within those parameters, there's been such great opportunities mm -hmm. throughout Q1. There's been so much nice market volatility and so many different events that are happening within the market. So we've been able to take advantage of some of those events and put up a really good Q1. But yeah, it's all the process is, uh, is key. Exactly. And I love that word that you said, risk management. And that is always number one is to watch our risk. We want to minimize our risk while maximizing our returns. And apparently you've done a great job with that. And I can't wait to go into further detail. But before we go into your trading strategies and your investing puzzle, um, tell us a little bit about your background, Andrew. How did you get into investing and trading? Yeah, for sure. So I grew up in Long Island, New York. And really, like ever since I was a child, I've always been the kind of person where when I get into something, I really latch on to it mm -hmm. and it becomes almost like a borderline obsession where I want to solve the puzzle. I want to do it. Um, as a child, I played a lot of tennis and I ended up playing division one tennis in school. Um, so that was really my main focus as a kid. Like, how do I become a better tennis player and really just how do I maximize my potential? In terms of like school and studying, I always hated that stuff. But then I took <laughs> I took an economics course in high school. It was during my senior year. And that really clicked for me where I was like, everything else I just learned was complete nonsense. But this is actually meaningful. So I started to develop that passion for economics. And uh, it was really when I was a college student, I was introduced to the market. I ended up double majoring in finance. And it was at the same time that my tennis dreams were kind of unwinding that I was like, oh my gosh, this, this asset management thing, this portfolio management thing, this is another game that I can really just pour all of my time and energy into. Um, so it ended up working out very well, uh, majored in economics and finance. I really wanted to get a job within the industry after school. And I ended up getting a role at the Vanguard Group, which is massive, massive mutual fund company. They manage trillions of dollars. And I started off in their brokerage department. So I was lowest of the low. I was working in their call center. I was talking to their retail clients about asset allocation, the Vanguard strategy, retirement savings. Um, it was actually an amazing first role. At the time, I didn't think so because I wanted to get into the trading and investing, but it was fantastic for learning asset allocation. Mm-hmm. Um, as I was coming up at Vanguard, I was really like the odd man out because I was in basically like the mecca of passive investing, but all I wanted to do was active management and mm -hmm. trading. So I was always trading my own accounts on the side and really just building up that acumen. Uh, I started studying for the CFA exams and I was able to knock those out, mm -hmm. which was great. And what was interesting was in my professional career, I got some really good opportunities. I got to work on their equity trading desk as a portfolio analyst. So I got to really see like, how is this institution buying all of these shares? How does it work when a client puts their money in? Like what's happening behind the scenes? And I got to work on their fixed income trading desk as well. But uh, what was crazy was I always wanted to go down that portfolio management route. And I ended up getting some good opportunities. There was an asset-backed securities trader role, applied for it, did 10 interviews, 
got second place. There was a there was a role on their quantitative equity group, active equity management. I ended up getting the role, but then the headcount was taken away. So I couldn't actually go into the role. And then finally, they had this very prestigious investment management development program. And they always selected only one internal hire every year. And it was like a beauty pageant to try to get this thing. It was so difficult. Mm -hmm. You had to have like the technical knowledge, time and job, the political connections in the company. Like there was a whole thing to it. Um, I ended up climbing that mountain and I was selected for that position, which was awesome. So Congrats. yeah, thank you so much. So I was like, okay, this is perfect. I'm going to do four different rotations throughout the company. You know, I'll probably launch into a really good position, be on the fast track to portfolio manager, like all this good stuff. Um, but what ended up happening was I was always actively trading in my accounts. Vanguard trades so many different securities and I ended up getting these compliance violations. I ended up getting kicked out of the program before the program even yeah. started. Um, it was off a trade that I made like 14 bucks on. It's it's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. But I went from being like all the way up here to just like knocked out of my dream career. Mm. So at that point, I had been making a lot of money trading on my own. And that was really when I jumped off and started doing this full time. So I've been at this for about four or five years now, full time. The first year was an absolute struggle. Um, I had been outperforming the market really since I started as a young man. When I first went full time, I had a significant bout of underperformance and it was a huge adjustment for me. I actually blew up one of my accounts. It was a really tough first year. Uh, but then we started putting the pieces together and it was just this whole regrouping process I ended up building my entire process back from the ground up. And we've had a really good three or four years now where honestly, I'm just so fascinated by the market and we just keep building on our process and making it better and better and better. So it's been a crazy journey. Amazing story. You know, challenges bring opportunities. And there you were, you know, your dream career seemed to have been over. And then here you are an entrepreneur you're doing it all on your own and your own terms. However, you have some amazing training that you went through. So it's all about the process, you know, yeah. it's about the journey and you seem to have had an interesting journey there. And here you are all on your own. You didn't give up. And, uh, you know, one theme I'm noticing with you that I love is that you make it fun and it's like a game. And yeah. even this U S investing championship you know, it's, it's fun, you know, it, it keeps you accountable, it keeps you going. And even though you may fall down and make a mistake here and there, you know, you keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And you have this challenge that you're doing. And um, I love it. Um, thank you so much for sharing that story and CFA very impressive. It's a very long process. Um, so um, congrats to you on all of the above. So let's get started with these emerging trends that your newsletter talks about. You have fantastic substacks, pristine capital, and I love your transparency. And that's key um, that you share your amazing market research and you're very transparent. Obviously with the competition, you have to be transparent, but you also are with your analysis of markets and macro. So what do you see with emerging trends right now where we are in the first half of 2023? Yeah, in terms of trends, you know, what I love is taking a really deep look at the macro and seeing how it translates into the markets. I find a lot yes. of investors, like there's so many different disciplines within investing and trading. And you can be a specialist at one and perhaps really make it. But what I found is you have to put those disciplines together. So with economics, like what I've noticed is heading into this year, every strategist was talking about an impending recession. Mm -hmm. And like the, the key narrative was there's going to be a big recession. The market is going to do horrible in the first half of the year. And then in the second half of the year, we can hopefully recover from that recession and, you know, things will go really well from the second half. 
And we have had the complete opposite. So far this first quarter, there's been a ton of volatility, but the market has gone up and to the right. So mm -hmm. what I've noticed is this recession that everyone is looking for, it's not here right now. And if it is here right now, it's in specific segments of the economy, uh, like commercial real estate, which everyone is now hyper, hyper focused on. Mm -hmm. We've got a banking crisis that was caused by higher interest rates. And I think the higher interest rates that were caused by the Federal Reserve, I think that's really the canary in the coal mine. Like if we have a recession, it's really going to be this Fed-induced blow up in the economy that ends up metastasizing. And so far, we had the banking crisis. We started to see banks blow up, but then the Federal Reserve stepped right in and they papered over the problem. So like when I was studying economics, we always learned about the economy, but I think every economics program should really emphasize the role of the Federal Reserve and central banks in the economy. And most of these programs don't do that. So I really think it's about the interaction between the economy and the central banks and how that translates to markets. And right now with the papering over of that crisis, we are just not seeing that weakness that a lot of investors are looking for. Well said. I think macro is key to the markets. It's the backdrop. We should always look at the macroeconomic conditions. Um, that's what provides the liquidity for the markets. Um, and rates are so important. Um, you know, we still have inflation and it's persistently elevated. We still have rising core month over month. We saw PE PCE numbers today. Not so good. I think it came in around 4.9 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, much higher than expected. And, you know, we still have a very tight labor market. And, Absolutely. you know, we saw, right, the claims even lower this month. And when you have all that phenomenon going on, you know, it seems that the rate hikes should continue and there shouldn't be these cuts that everyone seems to be talking about. And, um, you know, with all that, and then also the money supply. I mean, we know from economics, inflation is caused by too much money chasing, you know, fewer goods and services. So, and that's another issue we have. So with all that macro going on, what are your thoughts about the market? Do you think the market has run ahead of itself and there's going to be a reality check at some point soon? Yeah. So I think you made so many good points there. In terms of the market, I think a lot of what happens is very mechanical. And what I love looking at is the treasury market really reacts to all the economic data that's coming in. Mm -hmm. The way I see it is like, when I look at treasuries, those are basically my chief economists. Like I'm looking yes. at the treasury market and that is giving me some really good insight into what some of the smartest investors in the world are thinking. Um, so far, we've seen this historic inversion in the yield curve, mm -hmm. but by and large, the problem that we were having last year was inflation was too high mm -hmm. and that was pushing rates higher across the curve. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it raises bond volatility. And a lot of these volatility targeting strategies, they basically go, okay, bond yields are moving higher. That means higher discount rates. We have to sell some of these high valuation stocks. Mm -hmm. They also go bond volatility is rising. So I need to be carrying less exposure in the market let me sell some of my risk assets. Mm -hmm. And that boosts stock volatility as well. So what I've found so far for this year is the bond market volatility is nowhere near where it was last year mm -hmm. because we've seen that peak in inflation. And I still think inflation is a huge problem on Main Street, but it's on the decline. So we're not seeing that treasury vol and therefore the equity vol just hasn't really been there. And I think that's what's been so confusing for investors because it's like the inflation's still a problem. Like, what the heck? How's mm -hmm. how's everything okay? This should be blowing up. But just the mechanical nature of markets for right now is keeping things pinned together. Absolutely. I like that mechanical nature. Absolutely right. And I think when it comes to trading, you know, follow price, right? And I think you had a great tweet about that. Um, you mentioned something about price and the narrative follows price. I think you retweeted that it was something like that. And uh, there was another tweet that you had and it's regarding 
the, you know, the yields and the bonds and the treasuries um, was you mentioned the U.S. credit default swaps, the one year. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing the five year up higher, I think, than it's been since uh, the, you know, pre-GFC, I think around 2007, 2008 time period. What do you make of all that you're seeing with the low VIX? Exactly. So, yeah, what's what's really interesting is like, there's the there's all these different markets, and all of them have different information embedded into them. So, like, if you're talking to an expert in one different market, their opinion is embedded into that instrument. Mm -hmm. So, we are seeing the credit default swaps; they are really spiking. And that is definitely a major concern. I think a lot of equity only players, they might not be seeing that because that's mm -hmm. not something that they're going to have on their screens. I think really what that is coming down to is this potential government default and a failure to come to an agreement between both sides of government. And if that were to happen, when we already have this banking crisis that is emerging, if the United States were to get a credit downgrade, that could have severe implications for treasuries. And as I was saying earlier, like the market's been great because treasury volatility has been very low. That could really induce a lot of treasury volatility. So I think that's why we're seeing investors, they're paying up for credit protection. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing is like, it's also about understanding these different players within the market. If you're like a big asset manager and we have this debt default crisis and it's looming and it's all in the headlines and you're seeing it everywhere and you don't have protection on, if that event goes the wrong way and it goes south, and we saw an example of that in 2011, and you end up taking a massive drawdown and you didn't have protection, your career is in, in shambles. It's pretty much over. So we are seeing investors, they're buying that credit protection. And that's really what we're seeing manifested in that chart. But now the key question is, do they end up coming to an agreement or not? Because let's say they come to an agreement and they pass a higher debt ceiling. All those players, now they have to unwind that protection. And that could cause another leg higher in all risk assets. But we have to be cognizant that it could go the other way as well. So exactly. yeah, that's... There's a lot there. So that's where I think the news flow really comes into the picture and understanding these different events, understanding some of the deadlines and just being very cognizant of those risks that are on the table. Absolutely. We well, seem to do a very good job of all that, um, factoring in all those different elements, which is so important. You can't just focus on one data point. Um, it's very important to look across all asset classes and, you know, be cognizant, as you said, of all these potential risk factors of how they could swing either way. And I've been saying the only certainty is uncertainty. And mm -hmm. uh, so you have to be prepared and you have to have your risk management on at all times. Um, sure. What are your thoughts on earnings so far this season? Do you think we're getting this earnings recession? Um, I think the blended um, earnings is about negative 0.6.5%, something like that. And we have seen a pattern of, you know, lowering expectations and then coming back to beat. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts overall on what you're seeing? Yeah, so that's another key component in our research. We have an earnings tracker that we go through every morning in pre-market and then every evening when the companies report in the PM. And what we're seeing so far in earnings season, like one of our key setups that we track is power earnings gaps. Mm -hmm. And that's when a company puts up a really good earnings report, stock gaps higher, and you get really nice accumulation in that stock. We're not really seeing power earnings gaps this earnings season. So what's interesting to me is I think the bar is very low for these companies because mm -hmm. everyone's worried about the recession. So I am seeing some of these companies are kind of like bunny hopping over the bar, but they're still not getting a very good reaction. Mm -hmm. So into this earnings season, you really need like some key leadership stocks to propel the market. And so far, it's really just been a few mega cap tech stocks. Microsoft has been the standout, but within the small cap group, we're not really seeing those stellar earnings reports. 
So I do believe that things are slowing down in the economy just based mm -hmm. off of those earnings. But with everyone sort of like positioned for this and kind of waiting for it, it's weird where you can get slowness in Main Street, slowness in some of these companies, but the market is just kind of moving around and we're not really seeing that big volatility. So it definitely appears things are getting slower. Even Meta that just put up their earnings, like they beat, they're up 15%, but their numbers, like they're growing so slow. So I think a lot of investors, they're just looking for a safe spot to put their money and when they see a big cash flow generating company, as long as it's not imploding, it's like, all right, this is a good place to put my money. Uh, I think that's what we're seeing. It's pretty lackluster. Absolutely. I think it's, we expected it to be so terrible. So it's a little better than expected, but is that really saying much uh, is the question. You know, I always talk about the risk-free rates and, you know, when you look at them, even the three month, um, the one month, you know, um, tends to be at a good return. And I've been saying for a while, it's higher than the SPX and NASDAQ earnings yields. So overall, it, the market is expensive. And exactly as you said, except for some of these mega caps holding it up, I mean, across the board, the breadth isn't that great. Um, so what are your thoughts on all of that going forward? Yeah, I think what's interesting, I love posting this on Twitter. If you just invest your money in a money market right now, you can get exactly. an excellent return. You know, you can get almost 5% yeah. by taking no market risk. And as soon as the Fed hikes rates in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. that's going to be even juicier. Right, so, juicy. It's going to, I think they're going to go to 500 to 525. Um, for sure. 20, yeah, absolutely. And I think it continues. So yeah, we haven't had this high of a return, I think since uh, what, 15, 15 years or more, you know, so it's a uh, quite different uh, financial landscape. Um, for sure. So yeah, I, I mean, think mm -hmm. with these money market rates so high, what I try to think about is like when the market makes a nice run, I think about like over the next year, what's the odds that equities run another 5%? And if I don't think it's that high, then it's like, why am I not just in the money market? So I think that's mm -hmm. been another benefit throughout this first quarter. We've had nice two-way action. Once a lot of investors start piling into equities and they hop aboard, they reverse from their bearish stances, that's typically when the market ends up rolling over again, because I think everyone can see that the risk premiums so are just not really there. So it's like a cat and mouse game exactly. this year. Mm -hmm. I think the equity risk premium is the lowest it's been, the narrowest it's been since I think, uh, you know, 2007, eight time period as well. Um, and, you know, I, I love what you just said. It's like you're thinking in bets. And I've been using that term a lot lately. Annie Duke uses that. But you have mm -hmm. to always think of expected value of your decisions. And that's very important. I like what you said about how much more can the market run, you know? And if, if you think it, may not, you know, you put your money in a, you know, less risky asset, um, such as, you know, T-bills, there's many in a money market, like you talked about, um, there are many options. It's, it's, a, it's a different financial landscape than what we had in quite some time. Um, so, you know, regarding the banking crisis, um, now we have First Republic, you made a great tweet about that, saying, uh, who's going to buy these, uh, like hardly any value here, you know, who's going to buy this, you know, right? And there's been a general pattern of smaller banks consolidating to larger banks. Um, what are your thoughts in, in that and what you're seeing with your background in, in those assets? Yeah, so what's really interesting is this crisis started unfolding. And when it first started, it was just like this big unknown. And it was yes. like, uh, is the whole financial system about to topple here? <laughs> we had no clarity whatsoever. Then the Fed came in uh, with their BTFD, I mean, BTFP program. And uh, they basically papered over the problem where they're essentially zombifying a lot of these banks that aren't mm -hmm. going to make it. So what I've noticed, and I actually actively traded the banks uh, over the past two months, um, is I listened to all the big bank earnings calls. So I listen to like JPM, PNC, Citibank, all these different companies, Wells Fargo, m and Bank was the one that we traded. But it's, it's this zero-sum game within the banking sector. 
So like the what I noticed was when the banking crisis kicked off, all of the correlations of these banks essentially went to one. They were all trading down. Everyone was panic selling all the banks. But the correlations of the underlying businesses did not go to one. So like I listened to JPM's earnings call and they were like chests puffed out on the earnings call. They were like excited. They were talking about like all the benefits to their bank. They beat their numbers and then they raised guidance. So I think a lot of investors, they're thinking about this as like, this is either going to crater the banking system or, you know, the banking system is going to be fine. Whereas I see it much more, this is a changing of the guard. And a lot of those bigger banks are going to get even bigger and more powerful. Mm -hmm. And then some of these small banks, they are going to be nothing, zero zombies. But the Fed has their programs in place. So it's this weird situation, but absolutely, it's, uh, it's not it's so like binary. Exactly. It's not binary. And that's the key term. Um, you know, it's, I think it's going to be more of like a banking oligopolies. You know, you're going to see more gobbling up of these smaller banks by the larger ones. JP Morgan, I think is only going to get bigger. There's going to be less banks, more branches, you know, overall. And I think it's going to be a pattern. It's going to take time. I think this is all a very slow process and it's going to take time. Um, and you said keyword guidance. Guidance is so important. And I talk about that all the time in investing. It's about the future expectations of companies. And so always looking at the guidance. Um, so, you know, we have margins compressed, you know, higher cost of debt and capital, which is key, especially for smaller caps. Smaller companies are more sensitive to the rise in rates and, um, you know, higher cost of labor. We have a tight labor market. Um, we have higher cost of production, lower productivity, all of these different factors going in. Um, so it's definitely a lot going on in this environment on the micro and the macro level. Um, so what I want to talk about regarding the markets is mm -hmm. how you're able to do almost 50% return in quarter one. Tell us some thoughts. What was What are your best trades so far in quarter one? Andrew. Yeah, best trades so far. So our our whole philosophy is let's think like I'm a, a swing trader. So I'm fairly active in the market. But the whole philosophy is let's think about the market in terms of years, in terms of decades. Like my goal is I really want to put up a really good 30-year track record. So that is my focus. Nice. Yeah. This contest is basically like my coming out party, so to speak, where it's like, <laughs> okay, let's, let's really do this. So for the first quarter of the year, January was fantastic because everyone was super bearish on the market. And it was like, oh man, the market has to collapse. December was a really bad month for technology. So one of our key themes heading into the year is we're probably going to see some mean reversion within tech. Mm. So like when we were coming into the year, I was sharing with my clients that like these mega cap tech companies like Apple is trading at like a 12 PE ratio or like, you know, Microsoft is at like a 10 or like it was really crazy where like if you had just bought that business right there and held it for the next 10 years, that you're very likely to get paid on that investment. So we were pretty big in technology in the first quarter. We caught a really nice power earnings gap set up. And this ticker AEHR, it's a semiconductor small cap stock. Mm -hmm. I know that and, one very um, well. I traded mm -hmm. that one as well. Great. Oh, one. yeah. Yeah. That was a really good one. And then we played both sides of the market. So, like in February, there was a really good short setup in the market where everyone was getting long and everyone was on one side. And we caught a really nice short trade in February. So, that was actually like a poor month for the market but we did pretty well that month. And then in March, we really just focused on the banks and really just this theme that all the banks are declining, but the business fundamentals of all these banks are not declining. And we were able to catch some moves with that as well. So yeah, so far it's been a good sequence. Love that. You know, uh, you applied that contrarian thinking. You saw the crowd going one way and you went a different way and you looked to the details, not just the headlines. And that's so important. 
And um, so let's get a little deeper with the market. What are your thoughts on the various sectors or are you really thinking it's more of a select stock market? Yeah, I think that's what makes this environment so good for active investing and active trading. It's like such a cliche to say that if you're an active trader or active manager, but I really believe that's the case because for most of this year, there hasn't really been a lot going on at the headline index level. And there's been a lot of two-way action, but under the hood within these sectors and within these individual names, there have been really, really good moves. So far, what I noticed this year is I have a table where I look at like style factor performance, sector performance. And last year, the style factor that did the worst was growth stocks. They got punished as interest rates moved higher. Value stocks did very well all throughout 2022. So far this year, if you look at that style factor analysis, it's been the mirror image of 2022, where growth is doing very, very well. Uh, and it is the mega cap growth. Because if you think about it, it's like we have interest rates that are not as volatile and they've actually come down a little bit. Inflation is still high, but it's come down a little bit. So we're seeing growth rise back from the dead. But most investors think that we're heading into a recession. So they're not going to be buying the small cap growth stocks, but the mega cap stocks is what they're buying. So that's why we've seen like Apple, Microsoft, Meta, you know, all those stocks do very well. Mm -hmm. Right now we do have a position at Microsoft and that one is just the ultimate leader in AI. And they're going to do so many amazing things with that, with their investment in open AI. So it's very tough to, uh, to go against that mega trend, but really what I'm looking for, and this is very actionable mm -hmm. at some point as we either hit this recession, maybe eventually it comes, maybe in the second half of this year, actually, mm -hmm. there's going to be a good opportunity to buy those small cap stocks, mm -hmm. which right now are out of favor. So that's something that I'll be looking for. Like when this recession rears its ugly head, then I think that's where perhaps small cap growth could do very well. Mm. Great thinking. Um, you know, you mentioned the value to growth formula and that relationship, that ratio. I like to look at SPYV against SPYG. And last mm -hmm. year, like you said, we saw value gaining on growth. And now it's changed a little bit. And that's how the market is. Once it gets to the oversold part or once you're done with all the sellers, what do you have left? You have buyers and vice versa. Once you're all done with the buyers, you have the sellers. It's a buyers and sellers market. It's all about supply and demand. Um, so great thinking how you spotted um, all those patterns. It's about pattern recognition. So any particular small caps or any type of sectors you're eyeing, I've been talking about you know, it being a, an environment of necessities and we want to look at essentials and, you know, like the healthcare biotechs, you know, um, I also call cybersecurity a necessity. I think it's a backbone because we're all in remote work and everyone's working with the internet connections. And so we need cybersecurity and the semiconductors have been very strong this year. And I've been also playing those. Any other areas that you're looking at for the future in the small caps? Yeah, for the future, one that I'm really looking at is um, solar stocks. That's mm. a very interesting group. Array in there, maybe? Array, definitely. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there's some really good names in there. And that group is interesting because it had a really nice bull run. Mm -hmm. And the group has, by and large, been consolidating for about two years now. And the other thing as well is, like, if we go into a recession, that group, they are really helped by this Inflation Reduction Act. They've got some nice government tailwinds on the fiscal side. So that group could be one that does a little bit better if we do end up entering a recession. So far, we saw Enphase report earnings. That's like the big behemoth within that mm -hmm. group. The valuation for that one is very, very high. So that one got absolutely dominated and destroyed on its earnings report. But I'm going to be looking for some of those other companies like Array uh, there's another company, Maxion Technologies. Mm -hmm. I'll be looking at that one as well because those names have gotten crushed uh, alongside Enphase. So that's a very interesting group. And then I do believe 
all things crypto look very interesting because we are essentially exiting the worst possible environment for Bitcoin. And the worst environment is like Fed tightening, uh, Fed no longer uh, expanding the balance sheet and actually contracting it. I think that's why we saw such a big decline in Bitcoin last year. That is like the kryptonite environment for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. But if you believe that over the next 10 years, at some point, the Federal Reserve is going to expand their balance sheet once again, you really should be buying Bitcoin right now. So I think we are starting to see that. The correlation between Bitcoin and M2 money supply, it's very, very tight. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another reason why Bitcoin has done so well year to date, because we're exiting that horrible environment for cryptocurrency. Excellent points. And uh, I love talking about Bitcoin, you know, the inelastic supply of Bitcoin compared to, you know, central banks printing fiat money, you know, they're able to print, 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 but there's only 21 million Bitcoins out there. And many say it can't be corrupted, you know, um, you know, mm -hmm. there's a debasement of, you know, currency because of all the printing. And like you said, if, if you, and that it's always about what people's beliefs are. And none of us here are to tell anyone what to believe. But mm -hmm. if you are of the belief that there will be more money printing going on, you know, then yes, you know, Bitcoin is like an insurance policy. Um, it's also, you can call an alternative currency or a global reserve asset. You know, there's many, many words they call Bitcoin. They call Bitcoin freedom, um, you know, and I think there's definitely room in portfolios and, and certainly is in mine uh, to have some Bitcoins. Um, and it has broken away from the rest of crypto. And I believe it's still holding that high 20, 28, 29,000, that range around there, even though it did come down recently. Um, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin um, in the future? You think of it as an alternative currency or, um, you know, a global reserve asset and um, any NFTs? Are you uh, bullish on any of the other parts of that cryptocurrency? Yeah, my brother actually got me into uh, Bitcoin. My brother's an absolute genius. Wow. Um, and yeah, so he was the one that sort of got me into it. I originally came at it from like, the old traditional finance standpoint. I was like, what is this rubbish Bitcoin? <laughs> um, but he really showed me like basically the math behind it. It's just a math equation. It's really like we continue to have this debasement of the US dollar via money printing. Mm -hmm. And there really can be no debasement of Bitcoin. Yes. So it's really just, if you think that there's going to be more dollars in circulation in the future, you know what the supply of Bitcoin is. So it's really just a math puzzle. And what I've noticed with trading the asset is if you look at the correlation between Bitcoin and M2 money supply, and you lag the M2 by about six months, mm -hmm. there's a 0 0.72 correlation. Wow. So basically, if and when we enter the next environment where the Fed starts printing money, and we already saw a glimpse of this with the banking crisis. They mm -hmm. went and started expanding their balance sheet again. That's where you see Bitcoin could be a really strong, high-performing asset. So I allocate to Bitcoin every two weeks. I just buy a little bit of Bitcoin. And that's really just a long-term investment. And then on the trading side, I really look for that relationship with the M2 money supply. And that, I think, is the best Great way of really point. like trading the asset. I love that point. Um, that's very important to look at in correlation with the M2. Um, excellent, excellent points there. You know, overall fundamentals do matter. And um, I think that's the theme overall um, and regarding Bitcoin as well. Um, so, you know, I want to talk about your options trading. Now you're in the enhanced division of this U.S. investing championship. And once again, I'm going to repeat because it's just so amazing. You, you are in the top four for quarter one. Very impressive. And you are utilizing options. Please share with us your options trading strategies. Yeah. So when I started options trading, I really went very exotic with it. So I was doing 
uh, naked calls. I was doing iron condors. I was doing <laughs> yeah. butterflies. I was doing really targeted strategies. What I've found works really well for me is just doing naked calls, naked puts, having limited risk on the options. And I love living somewhere around like that 55 Delta. So I mm. love getting options that are slightly in the money. Mm -hmm. And if I'm looking for a move to play out, let's say like over the next six months, I'll likely buy an option that has an expiry maybe nine months out or maybe a year mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So I always add on like a little bit of extra time. But with those, I'm really using them as accents in the portfolio. So like what I find is, Say if there's a group like, you know, like Chinese equities, for example, where if you buy the stock, you could end up having a huge zero on your hands if there's some sort of regulatory change. So I can't really put like 30% of my capital into Chinese equities. But if I use options, I can take a 2% position in Chinese equities. And if that whole thing implodes, I lose 2% of my capital, but I don't really have a risk of losing 30%. So I find the options are very, very useful instruments, but they're really like, you know, the sprinkles on the Sunday. And I think a lot of investors, they try to use them as like, you know, the entire Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I really like using them in that way. And for uh, lower volatility instruments as well, like uh, treasuries, uh, the TLT long bond ETF, mm -hmm. it's not really too fast of a mover. Whereas if you use call options on the TLT, you can put a small position in there and you can actually get a move that's more comparable to like a growth stock or an equity. So it's very useful just for kind of like, uh, you know, changing the risk profile of these assets a little bit. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I also am an options trader and I agree with you. It should be used sparingly um, and not as your whole portfolio. Um, you know, you don't go all long calls uh, or long puts um, and, and, you know, that's very risky. Um, yeah. I, I also like to use spreads. Are you a spread options trader now in this market right now? I know you were very fancy to begin with, um, but are you using, utilizing spreads as well? I haven't used spreads this year, but I love spreads. I think they're really cool. And it's another way where you can use a really low level of capital and you can still get a decent bang for your buck. So I, I, I really like that method. And it's kind of like, especially for like mega cap tech stocks, like mm -hmm. rather than putting, you know, a massive position in an asset that doesn't really move that much, you can maybe put like 1% of your portfolio in a spread and you can play the asset that way. So I, I love spreads as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I enjoy doing like diagonals. Let's say I like doing the long call, you know, um, I, and like you do, like, I like longer time. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not a zero DTE type of trader. Yeah, <laughs> um, for sure. Yeah, I do the. I like to buy three months up, you know, to a year, and then when you sell, sell within like two months, maybe a month, because of that theta. You know, you yeah. have that theta burn, and um, you know, selling puts is something I enjoy doing to get shares cheaper. Do you utilize that strategy as well? Oh yes, definitely. So I, I love selling put options. Mm. Um. Like for example, like there's a bank, M and T Bank. Yes. Um, I'm short some put options in that one because the implied volatility is so high in all of these banks. Nice. Yes. And I've done the fundamental analysis on the company. I've got some levels drawn out. See, so yeah, I like selling the puts. And then also, like with uh, long stock positions, like Microsoft. Microsoft had a nice move after earnings. Mm -hmm. I sold some call options on my position, really just to continue hanging on to it. Mm -hmm. and uh, maybe juice out like another percentage point of return if it just goes sideways from here after that big move. Love that. So yeah, very useful. Very nice. I like when you higher IV, you have higher premiums. And during, you know, earnings reports, you have that nice elevation there. So it's a great time to sell right options. So I like your strategy. It's very similar to mine. Mm -hmm. um, lots of fun as well. Um, you know, let's talk about risk management because that's number one. And that is how you're able to stay in the leading top four in this competition. So mm -hmm. how do you use risk management? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I have, it's really like the key component of my process. I use a trend model that I developed many years ago. 
And it's basically looking at the market. It's using a couple of very simple uh, price and volume criteria. And it gives the market a score between plus three and negative three. And in a plus three environment, that's basically like a bullish sequence. Like the market is uptrending. Negative three is the market is in a downtrend. So what I do, and this has helped me tremendously as a trader, is I have different objectives for what I'm doing based off of where that trend model is. So when the trend model's at a negative three, my objective is no longer making money in the market. My objective is not losing money. So that is super important and it's very liberating because what mm -hmm. I used to find is like, oh, the market's in a huge volatility spell. Everything's crashing. Like, now what do I do? How do I make money here? And for me, it's like my trend model flips to negative three. I close out any positions that I have on. Usually I'm closing them out when it goes to negative one or if I see a divergence. And so long as it's at negative three, the market's basically giving me a day off. And I love it. In every other profession, people beg for days off of work. But in this profession, nobody wants to take their days off. And the market literally gives you days off. So the trend model is huge for managing risk. And then also for all my common stock positions, mm -hmm. I'm always defining my stop loss uh, before I enter the trade. I'm always looking for odds on my money. And the key is I made a commitment to myself that I am never going to let a trade go past my stop again. So when a trade hits my stop, I take the stop every time. So that was actually one of my goals for this contest. Take your stop every time. Every time the trend model flips negative, reduce your exposure, become defensive. And if I can do those things, I'll be really happy no matter what happens. But those are my keys for the year. Take every stop, reduce your risk when the trend model is negative. And that's really how I manage my risk. Love that. You know, you stay disciplined, consistent, and you follow your trading rules. And that's key. Now, do you have a set stop loss that you have across the board or does it depend on each stock and your entry? Yeah. Yeah. So it always depends on the stock and the entry. So like what I've noticed is I trade a lot of technical patterns as well. So I love combining the macro these different cross asset classes, the volatility of all of them, the narratives. But then it comes down to like, what is the setup on the chart look like? What do the price and volume dynamics look like? And my best trades and my best setups come where my invalidation point for the trade is very close to my entry point. So I love when I take a trade and I can set my stop maybe like 2% below my entry or 3% or 4%. I never go above eight because that's really just like I should be picking a different entry point. But yeah, usually the stop is between like two and 6%. That's really good for me. And then just making sure when the stop hits, I take it because it's it's not like it's, uh, oh my gosh, I, I messed that trade up. You know, I'm an idiot. Yeah, for me, exactly. It's just part of the process. It's part of the experience. And what I find like, especially uh, with my trading community, like, if you can just take a stop and just like laugh and be like, oh man, took that stop, whatever. And like laugh about it. You're in such good shape because most people cannot take stops. They just can't. So it's a huge differentiator. Wow. Those are some excellent points. I love your attitude that I have to commend you. You have a great attitude for this. Could you share with us your mindset? Were you always like this? Did you learn this over time? Because that is the key criteria. I always say mindset's about 80% of the execution. So share with us your mindset. Yeah, the mindset, I think it really came just from, you know, my mom really has like a fantastic mindset and she's always been instilling that in me ever since I was a little kid, especially with sports. You know, it was always just like, do your best. So like, I always have that in my mind, just do your best. Cause that's all you can really do. But yeah, through tennis as well, like you have to be very coachable. Mm -hmm. You always have opponents that are going to be able to beat you that can exploit you that can win points off of you. Like it's just always going to happen. And there's always going to be improvement points. So like as an athlete, 
you're just making so many mistakes over the course of a contest and making mistakes is just like everyone does it like Steph Curry, Michael Jordan, like everyone. Mm -hmm. Whereas like in trading, it's like this intellectual, like ego battle Mm -hmm. where like everyone wants to believe like they're the smartest person in the room. So they make the mistake and then they just don't take the stop or they can't admit that they were wrong. So I try to treat trading literally like it's a tennis match, literally like it's a game. Uh, And I know that if I take my stops, that's actually a huge advantage because I know so many other people can't do it. So when I take stops, I actually, you know, it's almost like I'm getting a high because I know I'm making the right decision and it's, it's just helpful. Amazing. I love that. I love your attitude. You're such a nice guy too. I have to say you have a great personality and you're welcome. And on Twitter, you're, you're just so kind and so sweet how you share all this valuable information, but I love how you make it a game. You talk about tennis and you, you compare it to tennis and it's true. It's like, I play tennis as well. And, you know, you make a lot of mistakes. I certainly do. And, you know, you just, uh, you're accountable and you don't go in denial. You accept them and you just keep moving forward. You know, mistakes are part of the process. And, you know, if if you don't, if you didn't make mistakes, you didn't really try hard enough, you know, and it's, it's just about being accountable and you you stay humble. And I think there's a famous trader, and I'm sorry, I forgot who it was, but they say, you go into the market um, always saying that my positions are wrong. There's um, there's a famous one, I don't know who it was. There's a lot of them, maybe, I don't know who it is, but you, know, you always go in saying all my positions are wrong, you know, and it's just about staying humble. You never wanna get too arrogant and, um, you know, just, you know, always know that there's, like you said, in a competition, there's always, you know, something to be learned from all these challenges and mistakes. So I love that attitude. You have a great attitude. Um, so we're going to wrap up, but I want to ask you um, one final, b- before we get into your sub stack and your discord, um, mm-hmm. your current allocation, are you staying in more cash? Are you trying to stay very nimble and your time frames right now? I know you buy options, you know, longer time to give yourself more time, but are you trading them much sooner? What is your time frame and your allocation during this time period of sideways market? Yeah. So what I found for this contest is like, there's a lot of beauty in just doing nothing. <laughs> so like, yes, there's been various points throughout this first quarter where I'm very aggressive in the market and I have a lot of exposure, but then as soon as I feel like the edge is gone, then I'm just dialing back that risk very quickly. Um, so for the past couple of days, my trend model has been at a negative three. And even before it flipped to negative three, it was at a negative one and the market was still doing pretty good. Some stock positions were still working, but I started to see some divergences. So I proactively took down almost all of my risk, went to maybe like 80% cash. Mm. Over the past couple of days, yesterday, the trend model flipped from negative three to negative one. So I added some test exposure and now today it's flipped to positive one. So I'll probably add a little bit more exposure, but the stock setups have to be there. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, today I'm seeing trend model flip to plus one, but treasuries are selling off and that's a pretty big divergence for me. So I think even though the trend model is at a plus one, I'll still probably be a bit more conservative. Mm -hmm. Right now I don't have any call options on. I'm in all common stock. And uh, for right now, I'm pretty conservative. I'm waiting for a really good fat pitch. And usually that comes with a company that reports really good earnings. See, I have a couple of trades on, but I'm actually pretty light headed into month end. Mm, Very nice. I like that. Um, Yeah, reduced position sizing is key. And I love how you have a sliding scale on this trend um, monitor that you created, which is very impressive. Um, how it uses you use a gate that as a gauge and then how you apply treasury selling off to be more conservative um great great um, investing puzzle that you have mm-hmm. andrew and it's been such a pleasure talking you're fantastic i'm very impressed um with your strategy and the way you do th- you're like it's like you're made for this you have a great attitude and that's the key it's it's that attitude 
um, that you have and you're very humble. Please tell everyone how they can stay in touch with you on your Discord. I didn't know you had trading in your Discord. Tell us about that, please, and your Substacks. Absolutely. So we have a Twitter account, and then we also have our Substack where we give nightly research reports on the market. So it's called pristinecapital.substack.com. We do a nightly research note Monday through Thursday. Then we also do a weekend analysis video every single weekend. And then we also have our Discord, which is really just like real-time thoughts throughout the day. A lot of these thoughts I'm actually not posting on Twitter. Um, and I post my trade executions as well in Discord. So for right now, if you join the Substack, the premium version, we are allowing people into the Discord. We're giving them an invite. But at this point, we have such a nice group. I love the size of the group. The people in it are all really good traders, all really nice people. Um, so we won't be doing that for long. So yeah, definitely visit us, pristinecapital.substack.com if you like this analysis and this approach to the market and really just the long-term mindset. Absolutely. The longevity in the market. And that's key. You know, I love how you said you, you want to gauge yourself on 30 years of investing in trading, not just right now. And that's so important. Love your mindset. And I love your tweets. Your sub stacks is fantastic. Everyone should check you out. Um, you have uh, a great strategy in place. Thank you so much, Andrew, for taking the time to speak with us today and enlighten us on your amazing strategies. Thank you so much, Rosanna. This was an awesome conversation. Thank you so much. It was really nice meeting you, chatting with you. And uh, thank you so much. Best of luck with everything. Your show is awesome. Thank you so much. You're awesome. You're such a nice guy. It means a lot. Thanks. Thank you for listening to The Rose Show Podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon. All investment, real estate, financial, legal, and tax opinions expressed by Rosanna Prestia or on The Row Show should not be relied upon as professional advice and are intended to be used for informational purposes only.